my name is Catherine, I'm the Uliest Whooping and this is Naomi. And I'm the Children's Master. We are so, so excited that you've joined us here this morning. Um, we are going to worship God in a few and we've got a great, great word coming for us as well. Uh, but before we do, we are just going to commit this service um, to the Lord. Yeah, so Father God, I thank you um, that we can connect together online. And although it might not be, it might not feel the same as being together in the building, that we can still connect with each other and worship together. Um, I pray that we have a great time worshiping you this morning and that we come away feeling refreshed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, should we just get into it? Let's go. Let's do it. Ah, 
I saw Satan fall like lightning I saw darkness run for cover But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven My praise belongs to you forever This is my testimony from back to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ and Together, sons and daughters, born with blood and walks in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony from death to life. This grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm testifying. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Oh, 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 oh. If I'm not dead and you're not dead. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead and you're not dead. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead and you're not dead. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead and you're not dead. testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm testifying this is my testimony this is my testimony this is my testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous we truly do have a testimony if you are a christian then you know that as christians we've been brought from death into new eternal life in christ and i don't know where you guys are at i don't know how you're feeling right now but i know that as long as you have breath in your lungs and as long as you are a christian then you have a reason to worship god you have a reason because you have a testimony amen amen um, so now we're going to have um, a reading and a prayer from Mark Truby, and then we're going to carry on with some more worship. Morning City Church, our reading this morning is from Psalm 131, a psalm by King David. And these are the words he says. He says, My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have stilled and quieted my soul. I am like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child I am content. O Israel, put your hope in God, both now and forever 
more. And this is a wonderful psalm. It's a psalm, as I said, by King David. And it's a psalm primarily all about trusting God. And as we know, David was a man in the Bible that was described as a man after God's own heart. So I think we can learn so much from David on how he relates to God by looking at his psalms. He says to begin with, my heart is not proud, O Lord. David knew the importance that when we approach God, we must approach him with humility. But then he says these words, I have stilled and quieted my soul. Do you know that we have a responsibility to still and quiet our own souls? The soul is so much described as the mind, the will, and the emotions. But I don't know about you, but for me personally, most of the time I exalt my soul. Whatever I feel, well, that must be the truth. But David said, no, 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 no. I'm not like that. I've learned to still and quiet my soul. David would speak to his soul. We know in Psalm 42, he would say, oh, my soul, why are you so downcast? Put your hope in God, both now and forevermore. David had stilled and quieted his soul. His mind, his will and emotions were brought under submission to the scripture and to God. And then he says these words. He repeats this phrase. He says, like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child, I am content. Now that might not make a lot of sense to us, but in the ancient Near Eastern cultures, what would happen is that children wouldn't be weaned until about the age of maybe three years old or a bit older, which is very different from here in the UK. And they were used to getting that nourishment and that comfort from their mothers. And could you imagine the tantrum that a three-year-old would be playing when that would be taken away from him, the confusion that would happen. And David's liking himself to this weaned child. He's saying that, God, I'm no longer approaching you from what I can get from you, but I'm approaching you now for who you are. Not for what you can give to me, but I'm approaching you because I love you. I love your company. I love your presence. After that child goes through that confusing and, and painful time, why is mummy no longer providing for me anymore? And then the child comes to that place of contentment. David is saying, I am now content. I've gone through this difficult season, but I've come to this place of contentment. Like Pastor Michael was saying last week, wasn't it? Like the Apostle Paul, I've learned the secret of being content in all things. David is saying, God, I am with you. I have stilled and quieted my soul. I am with you because I love you, not because of what I can get from you. And then he ends the psalm by saying, now Israel, put your hope in God. But before that David could be a, before David could proclaim to Israel, he first had to allow God to do that work on the inside of him. God will always start a work on the inside of us before he can use us to proclaim his message and to be messengers of the gospel. Let's pray. O oh, Heavenly Father, we pray, O oh Jesus, we pray that you would forgive us from our pride our self-reliance, our self-sufficiency, thinking that we can do it without you. And you said that you can do nothing without me. We pray, God, that you'd help us to still and quiet our souls. Help us to be still and to know that you are God. And Father, through this weird season, through this epidemic that we're going through, Father, we ask that you would teach us the secret of contentment. That, God, that we could be a light, that we could be a voice of hope, that we could be a beacon Father, to a lost and dying world and that we would be able to be proclaimers of hope and proclaimers of the gospel because of the work that you've done in us. We ask that you would do this, God, for your name's sake and for your glory. In Jesus' name.
taking our thoughts this morning from Psalm 40. It's a psalm of David and uh, he he speaks about a time in his life when he, he was in an impossible situation and there was there seemingly no way out. He describes it like this. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord and he heard my cry. He's already bearing testimony that God came through and delivered him. But what he delivered him from was quite a picture. He says, I felt I was in a pit. I was in a horrible pit. And my feet were in sinking clay. So you can imagine how poetically he, he describes the most awful time of his life when he was in this horrible pit sinking in the mud. Now, the word horrible that he uses here actually in the original, means noisy, full of clamour. So 
I think what we're talking about here is David felt in a dark place where the only sounds around him were so oppressively dark, so oppressively pressing in on him, that it was like a cacophony of sound that he just couldn't make head and a tail of. And it might be that it was some advice from here and another set of advice from there and somebody going on about it over there and just people trying all the time to give him answers that none of them were in keeping with the word of God something that did not resonate with his spirit now, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you've been in a deep problem and you've had all manner of conflicting advice that you should do this you shouldn't do the other and you can't hear God because of the noise David said, I waited patiently. And in the waiting, he finds deliverance. He finds God coming through and bringing him his answer. So he's in this horrible place. Every effort he makes to get out just pushes him deeper in. Because if you are trying to dig yourself out of a muddy clay, it just is nigh impossible. Which reminds me of a situation many years ago when... I lived in the uh, in the Lake District and friends came up to visit us and one of them had previously lived there. He actually been born there. And the suggestion was that we climb the highest mountain. So off we set early one day to climb the highest peak in the Lake District. And we achieved it. After many hours, we got to the summit. But as is often in the Lake District, the weather can change in the blink of an eye and the mist came down and the fine rain started to fall and it was foggy and we couldn't see the pathway back. One bright spark in our group said, let's follow that little river, that stream. Uh, it's flowing down, so that must be the way down. And I can tell you right now, if you haven't already guessed, that's not a clever thing to do. Uh, but even the guy that lived there or was brought up there didn't seem to think that was so bad. So we followed the little river, but the little river became a slightly bigger river and the bigger river became a couple of small waterfalls until we had got so far down the, the ravine that we now stood virtually on the edge of a cascading waterfall that went uh, many, many hundreds and hundreds of feet down into the into the valley below. Well, of course, we couldn't continue, so we turned around and try to get back up. But the mud and the slurry of, of the, the embankment prevented us from being able to get out of that uh, trough. It took us a long time of helping one upon the other to heave out until we got one person out who could then grab a hand and help pull up. Eventually we all got home safe and sound. I'm here to tell the tale. But it reminds me of how hard it felt to try and climb in wet mud almost impossible you needed another hand to lift you out and David paints this picture and he says I'm in a deep pit I'm in a deep pit with clay all clogging up my feet no matter how hard I try I just go deeper in and then he speaks of a dramatic change because he introduces that with I waited patiently and the Lord answered me I was in that place but I'm not there now and if you are in a situation where life is really tough or uh, you've got a problem you just can't see your way out of, you've tried to get out and you've got nowhere with it, I can only recommend to you that you wait on the Lord. I don't mean be inactive or lazy or just say, oh, well, God will deal with it. I mean, seek his face. Ask for wisdom. Ask for the guidance of God. What should I do in this circumstance? And it may be that you can hear the voice of God. This is the way, walk in it. So David was in an impossible place. And he brought a, it brought about a dramatic change. He says, my feet were in the clay. But God heard me. And he lifted me out. And he put my feet on the rock. What a contrast between slurry that will suck you down and a rock that will hold you firm. I can't recommend highly standing on the rock. The rock Christ Jesus, what did Jesus say? What did he ask me to do? How should I live according to the purposes of God? We have to have those in. We can't just bring God in uh, when we need him and not think about him afterwards. He has to be a constant in our life. 
David said, I waited on the Lord. He had a relationship with the Lord and he waited on God. He trusted the Almighty. And it's so good to trust the Almighty. He will lead you and guide you and bring you through. So here's the picture. He is he's in a noisy place. It's full of uproar. It's full of noise and clamor and people who are just giving all this crazy advice. But he seeks to hear God and he says, I will wait for God. I will wait till God speaks to me and I will follow that thought. Uh, <clears throat> so he, he turns a deaf ear to the cacophony and he waits on the Lord. And God brought him, as I said, to this place of safety and he put his feet on the rock. Everything else was an impossibility, but God performed the impossible. The rocky place that he, he mentions here, it actually translates as the high place or the lofty place. He brought me from a deep, dark hole into a high, good place. What a great picture of what it is in redemption, salvation, and our walk with God. When we get ourselves in a place where we think this is so low, you couldn't possibly get any lower. If you wait patiently, patiently on the Lord, he can raise you up to new days and better times. So he brings you to a safe place. And that's the that's what David is saying. Here. He said he put me in a safe place and it felt like my feet were on rock rather than mud. What we don't want to do is to come to God and ask, can you God, can you make me? be a little more comfortable where I am. What you don't want to be is comfortable in the pit. You want to be out of the pit. You want to be out of the mud, out of the slurry, out of the sludge, and out of the dark, noisy clamour. You don't want to be more comfortable in the problem. You want to get out of the problem. And David is painting that picture for us, how to get out of the problem. And it may be that when God moves you out of the pit, he can establish you in a place that he has always provided for you, whether it's a physical betterment, whether it's financial, whether it's it's uh, emotional, whatever it is that has been the problem, he can bring you to a better place, a place of rest, a place of hope and a place of future. Isn't it good to know that God has provided a hope and a future? Do you look at your days as days that are full of hope and future? I hope you do, because when you read this psalm, you can see and sense David says, I was back there in that terrible situation, but he brought me to a place where my feet were on solid ground. He set me up there. And I think that that idea of being set up is, is amazing. Um, it made me think when I read it again, it made me think of sometimes when I've seen old buildings or um, buildings that have stood the test of time and above the above the door or at the high lintel you often see carved in stone established and then they put a date to it saying established in 1858 or whatever and what it was was that when that was constructed it was intended to stay there it wasn't temporary buildings there's a lot of temporary buildings that we see go up today pre prefabricated ones and they can be used for anything. I mean, if a supermarket's in one and they don't continue, they rip it down, it becomes a car showroom. It could be anything. They're so prefab. Um, but the old stone buildings were meant for purpose. It's an establishment. And what David is saying here is he established me on a rock. I used to be in the mud, but now he's established me in the rock. And what it meant is here I stand and here I stay securely held by God, securely nurtured by the Almighty. When God rescues you from a trouble, he does so with the express purpose of seeing you become stronger and safer. When he put David's feet on the rock, David was stronger and safer. And I think that's the purposes of God, to build us up in strength and security. And he encourages us to press forward, to go on from there. It might be good to suddenly feel, oh, I'm out of my problem. God has delivered me. My feet are on solid ground. But you have to look to the future. You have to believe that God will continue to walk with you. And you have, you have to press on in faith. You have to go forward in the work of God that he has established in you. The way ahead um, 
won't be without trial. It won't be without temptation. It won't be without circumstances that challenge you to the hilt. But you will have learned that God is always going to be with you. He will neither leave you nor forsake you. He will deliver you. He is conscious of your needs. He's conscious of the difficulties that we face. And he will be there. He will not leave us. And David knew that the way ahead was still going to be full of trouble. He, but he had, he had the witness and the experience that if God could get me out of that pit and get my feet out of that slurry and he could put me in a brighter place and put my feet on solid ground, if he could do that, if he could do it then, he can do it again. And it built his faith. And so, though that was retrospective, it built up what he was now about to address. And by the time we come to verse 13, David says these words. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. So now we're talking in a current situation. So point number one on this is you may be in a situation you think you can't get out of. But if you stop listening to the cacophony of sounds of ill advice and you start listening to the wisdom of the of the Lord and you seek good counsel. You might find that then when you're lifted out of the mire and placed on solid ground, you will have an anchor. However, what it establishes in you is not just taking a breath and saying I'm out of problems. But when more problems come, I know what to do. I will call upon the Lord in days of trouble. I will walk with him and talk with him, whether it's in the daylight of success or in the night of uncertainty. He is never changing. And so David turns now and he says, as you did then, so do now. Answer me. Make haste, O Lord, to help me. There's a little bit of um, a contrast there. I waited patiently for the Lord. Now he's saying, make haste. He has learned something. While he waited patiently, he had a need to be fulfilled in and that of that moment. Now he realizes he can call on the Lord and the Lord will answer him. So he says, make haste, O Lord, in this time. Continue to make your appeals to God. Don't ever give up seeking the face of God. Even though he saved you, even though he has established you, released you from the enemy's grip, brought you into the kingdom of God and granted you abundant life, keep seeking God. Beware of an enemy that wants to come and close in on you and trouble you. You see, God is for you. And he's not against you. He wants the best for you. But he also wants you to learn his ways. In verse 17 of this psalm, David writes these words. But I am poor and needy. Yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O God. Just let those words sink in a moment. I want you to see the picture of the man who said, I'm in a pit, I'm in the dark, I have terrible noise all around me, that's ungodly chatter. My feet are sinking in the clay. You brought me out, you delivered me. You put me in a high place, you put my feet on a rock, I felt secure. I know life gets difficult and I can see the next hill that has to be climbed, the next problem to overcome. Lord, I call on you. Be swift to answer me. I'm poor and needy. You see, humility, it goes a long way. I don't mean beating yourself up. I mean humbling oneself before the Lord, realizing we're not the answer to our own problems. We may be the result of doing the wrong thing, but we can't always answer our problems. You see, some problems are more spiritual based than physical. Now, if there's a physical thing, you can tackle it. 
But if it's spiritual, you're fighting not flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and wickednesses. And we need to come before God and put on the whole armour of God. We need to make sure that we're well equipped to come forward in the promises of God and make our stand against the enemy. To come up against our Goliaths, to see them beheaded and destroyed. To come against those who would uh, seek our demise and realise that our names are written in the book of life and we are established by the king. And that's the thing. King of kings and Lord of lords. Who has established you? The king of kings has established you. And it's just a matter of being reminded of these things and saying we're poor and needy without you. We, we, we can't make our own salvation. We can't create our own save, savior in, a, in our image. You can't take Jesus and make him in the image you want him to be. He is king of kings and Lord of lords and you follow the master. But when you do, he can lift you out of the pit, put your feet on solid ground. He can establish your way. He can give you the strength to go forward. And even when it gets tough, you can turn to him and say, without you, Lord, I'm poor and needy. Think about me, Lord. What David is saying here is, I need you to remember me now. And God says, of course, I'll remember you. I will not forget you. He says, you are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay. It's that point of trust when you put your whole heart into trusting the king. And you've got to maintain a humble heart. There's a place for us to walk humbly before God. There's a place for us not to presume upon the kindnesses of God, but also to believe in them. And if that's difficult to grasp, it, it, it's, it's not really. Don't make a presumption. Oh, God will sort it out. But believe that he can. And that if you humble yourself, he will raise you up. Don't presume upon grace. But you live by grace. You live in the grace of God. And by not presuming, I simply mean, don't get a little bit self-centered. Oh, I'm saved. God will do this. Oh, I'm saved. God will do that. You come to God and you humbly seek him. And because God is good, he hears our cry. Live in the abundance of his promise by all means, but do not presume. And the Lord will be with you. So if you are in a dark place, if you are in a pit, and all your flailings just take you deeper down, wait patiently for the Lord and call upon him in the day of trouble. He will lift you. He will establish you. If you look into the future and you're not sure which way to go, Seek the Lord. He will show you the way to go. This is the way to go. Walk in it. So learn the simple things and be reminded of the things you already know. Walk in faith. Walk in hope. Walk in trust. And you too can have a testimony that says, he got me out. He'll walk with me again. He'll establish me in his ways. So I pray that you look at this psalm. I'd like you to sort of read it in your own time, again, with some of those images in your mind, that God is for you and not against you. And the Lord will keep you and the Lord will bless you. So be strong, be courageous, be humble, be faithful, and know that he who established you will see you through to the end. God bless you. <laughs> You unravel me 
with a melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone and I'm no longer
children of God. We are the children of the King. We're children of God. Well, good morning, everyone. It's really good that we're able to be together today. It's been lovely to worship the Lord and to spend time together in his word. And now we have these lovely moments of gathering together around the bread and the cup. These emblems that have so much to say to us regarding the incredible love of God our Father. And of course, it's a unity that comes through Jesus and through his death. It's his death on the cross that unites us. And it's lovely that as an expression of our unity, today we are going to take the bread and we're going to drink the cup and we're going to remember him and we're going to be united as we do that, united in our expression of our love and our worship and our adoration. And as we do this this morning, I want to encourage you to worship him and to adore him and to give him the glory and the honour that he so rightfully deserves. As we remember him, we also remember one another. We share in the one bread, we're partakers in, in the one sacrifice. We don't stand in isolation, we stand as family, united in Jesus. And as we're remembering our Saviour, we want to remember one another this morning and thank God for one another. And we're going to take a moment at the end of our few minutes together to, to pray God's blessing on each other. I want to read a couple of verses from Isaiah 53, familiar words. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely. He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds, we are healed. Father, I want to thank you this morning for your incredible love for each and every one of us. A love that caused you to send your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us, that we could be forgiven. And Father, this morning we thank you that we stand before you forgiven. We thank you for restored relationship. We thank you for the righteousness of God that is ours in Christ Jesus. We want to thank you, Lord Jesus, for bearing the punishment that has brought us peace. And we do rejoice this morning that by your wounds, we are healed. Thank you, Father. And Father, I want to thank you for the bread that we're going to share together and the cup that we will drink from today. We thank you for the bread that reminds us of your body that was given for us. And we thank you for the cup that speaks to us of your precious blood that was shed for us. I pray your blessing upon the bread and the cup and upon us as we eat and drink 
together this morning. Father, I pray in each home right now, there will be such a sense of your nearness. I pray that you'll come close. So together, we take the bread. Thank you, Lord. We eat. We remember Jesus. We take the cup and together we drink and again we remember Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We bless your name. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for all that you do. And now, Father, we want to pray for one another. We thank you for our brothers and sisters. We want to thank you for our city church family and for the whole church family around the globe. Thank you that we stand together united in Christ. Father, we pray for health and strength. We pray for your presence and your peace. We pray for your protection and your provision. And right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, for any who are sick in body, I pray health and healing and wholeness. Let them know your touch. For those who are sick in heart or in head, Father, would you come and minister your life and bring healing in the name of Jesus. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. And may he be gracious to you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Well, everybody, that is it. Thank you so, so much for joining us this morning. We hope that you've been blessed by everything uh, that's been said and done at Church at Home this morning. Yeah, and there's so many opportunities in the week for you to connect with us. So we've got a Bible study on Tuesday. On Thursday, you can connect uh, with us in communion. Um, and there's loads and loads of other stuff. Uh, for all different people in the week as well. So make sure you stay connected on our social media platforms. Yeah, so we are looking to move towards meeting together in person um, in September and we will be sending out a survey to anyone that calls this house their home and we would love if you could fill it out and then we can get a good idea of what services will work for you. Yeah, and that's it, I think. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us this morning and we'll see you again next time. Have a great week. Bye.